an achingly empty launch pad 39B in Florida tonight, newly refurbished launch pad 39B. Space Shuttle Challenger was the first to leave its embrace in more than a decade. It blasted off in a blaze of fire amid the ice on the pad. A scant minute later, gone in all a consuming ball of fire. All that was challenging, all the technology and hopes, and seven people riding on the top of a half million gallons of rocket kick. Six astronauts and a teacher who was us all, gone forever in a matter of seconds. Hours later, national mourning and a national eulogy. Honor us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. And it's a this is a CBS News special report. Disaster in space. Reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. It was there for all to see, open, above board, almost routine. Another space shuttle launch. So many saw it happen, so little is still known tonight about why it happened. Tonight, the search planes and desperate rescue helicopter crews that had looked for signs of survivors all day in vain, tonight they were recalled. They will start again at first light. Ships are still crisscrossing off the coast of Florida. All they have found in the cold Atlantic is small debris from the once mighty Challenger. The largest pieces of that debris, no bigger than two feet wide and under 10 feet long. That is all that remains tonight of seven hero pioneers and tons of high tech. Some of America's best and brightest young people, some of the most complex machinery and electrical apparatus in the history of humankind. It happened at Challenger's moment of full thrust, point of highest stress, where metal meets air at 2,000 miles an hour. It happened in real time before noon, a slow motion horror for all who watched. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six. We have main engine start. Three, two, one, and lift off. Lift off. And it has cleared the tower. The president, uh, like all Americans, watched this on television. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. Challenger, go with throttle up. Obviously a major malfunction. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. Joining us now in Los Angeles is Leo Krupp, a former shuttle test pilot uh, for Rockwell International. Leo Krupp, good to have you with us this evening. What I would like for you to do, first of all, is let's take a look of the videotape from today. Uh, talk us through it where the places are, where there are questions, where the suspicions are. But before we do that, let's uh, take a look at the scale model we have in the studio with us, uh, Leo Krupp, and check me as we go along here. Uh, just a reminder that the space orbiter, the spaceship itself, the space shuttle Challenger, is attached to this huge fuel tank which contains liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. The liquid hydrogen, highly explosive. Off on the sides are the solid rocket fuel boosters, two of them. And in space shuttles, the plan is for the whole apparatus, the engines at the tail of the space shuttle, plus the solid rocket boosters, all to go off the launch pad in one big thrust. And it has to be throttled back a bit, then throttled forward. And as it uh, reaches just past the two minute mark, the plan is for the solid rocket boosters uh, to jettison away and fall away. The space shuttle with its engines down here continues on up using the fuel out of this tank on upward towards space and eventually the big fuel tank itself drops off leaving the shuttle to uh, orbit the earth now that's the way it has worked in the past now leo krupp uh we i want to remind you if i may or perhaps point out to you if you had a chance to read it 
that the United Press International says tonight that speculation about what caused the Space Challenger, Challenger to explode shortly after takeoff Tuesday focuses primarily on the spacecraft's large fuel tank, but NASA officials declined comment on what may have triggered the blast. Now, with that in mind, let's try to take a look now uh, at the videotape of the blast off today. Well, Leo, as we wait for the uh, videotape to get uh, completely down to the point where we want to take it up, uh, had you heard that speculation about uh, the, the, ex the suspicion area centering, focusing on the main tank? Well, uh, there's no doubt, Dan, that the main tank was the explosion, uh, the fuel for the explosion. And what triggered it, uh, I think, is, is conjecture right now until NASA has a chance to look at all the, the items. There were some suspicious flame patterns around the nozzle area of the left, what appeared to be the left solid rocket booster. And that could have been the ignition source, but I'm sure that everybody agrees the fuel for the explosion came from the main tanks, from the external tank. Well, let's take a look now at the videotape and have you talk it through us, uh, emphasizing as we go through this that there may be many theories and uh, many hypotheses, but no one at this hour actually knows what happened. This was the scene at the launch site. Seven, six, we have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Lift off of the everything is everything in the launch looked the it, perfectly normal up to the point when he was going through max uh, dynamic pressure and uh, this camera angle will be looking up the, the stern or up the tailpipe of the of the vehicle as it gets up so you can't really see too much but just as he goes through the max uh, dynamic pressure region where he throttles his engines back, the three main engines back to 65%, and then he throttles them back up to 104 after he's through this area. The camera will switch from the from the stern view to a side view. And when it switches to the side view is when you can see the first thing that looks abnormal, and those are some little what appear to be flame leaks around the, the, the aft end of the left booster, which is the one closest to you as you're viewing this. Now, we're just about to see that, I think, Leo, crop in a few seconds. Okay, as we switch to the side view, just watch toward the aft end of the solid rocket booster, and you'll see some little flame patterns come out, and those appear to be the ignition source. There you can see them, and that... And there's no doubt the, uh, the fuel for the explosion came from the external tank. But the, the question is, what caused it? And uh, NASA, I'm sure, will have an answer for this after they recover all the debris and, and look at all the data. Now, Leo Krupp, let's do as we have done uh, during the day, take a closer look at the critical moments uh, just before and during the explosion in slow motion. This is the side view that you mentioned. Okay, you can see the little uh, flame leaks coming back there now, just forward of the nozzle. And you'll see one that impinges, jumps up forward and impinges up on the belly of the vehicle, up near where the umbilical from the external tank right there, and that provided the ignition source which caused the, resulted in the catastrophic explosion. Leo Krupp, former shuttle test pilot for Rockwell International. So we, our viewers and listeners can understand the area in which you called attention as one of the suspicion areas while emphasizing all the way through that nobody actually can know what happened and why. What you were talking about, Leo, is the, was, was this area, this being the solid rocket booster on the left side uh, from the pilot's position in the capsule, right down in here is where you first saw those flashes. That was the first thing that looked uh, out of the ordinary or abnormal about the flight. Up to that point, everything looked perfectly nominal. It looked like a perfect launch. And then, very quickly, uh, there was a, a brighter uh, flame a little further up on what appeared to be the area of the main fuel tank, that is the, the liquid fuel tank, liquid oxygen and liquid uh, hydrogen, and then very quickly the, the, the massive fireball explosion. That's right, and uh, it appeared that this happened so rapidly that the crew did not have any time to react. Uh, uh, there is a provision for the crew to do a fast separation. If they know something is amiss in a solid rocket booster or the tank, they can do a, what we call a fast separation, and they can separate the shuttle from that package. But this occurred so rapidly that I, it appeared that the crew did not have any time to react at all to the uh, pending disaster. Leo, on our model, what you're talking about, there is a provision where uh, if the commander and pilot ha have an indication in time, if 
they can quickly separate just the space yeah. orbiter itself away from all the fuel, but there's no indication anywhere at any time today that they had uh, even a, a second or two to do that. No indication at all. The other thing we want to mention is the large fuel tank, the one that the United Press International says uh, is the focus of the investigation uh, as it begins as to where the explosion may have uh, started. That massive external fuel tank is manufactured by Martin Marietta Aerospace uh, in Louisiana. It contained a half a million gallons of uh, highly explosive uh, fuel. Uh, the fuel is the most explosive element in the whole system, but we emphasize that nobody at Martin Marietta Aerospace or with NASA is saying that the explosion actually began in this tank. They simply do not know. Thank you very much, Leo Krupp in Los Angeles. We want to go now to uh, Houston, where our old friend uh, astronaut Alan Bean, uh, former astronaut and present artist and painter Alan Bean, who flew on both the Apollo and Skylab missions, uh, it's tough, I know, but Alan Bean, what runs through your mind as you watch the launch, having been there yourself, and if I may, I'm particularly interested in, based on your experience, what was happening to the crew members minute by minute from the seconds before launch right on through this disaster? Well, Dan, from, uh, from the time you get in up till about 15 minutes, you've got a fairly leisurely pace, and so you're thinking about the launch and you're thinking about how the mission's gonna go. When it gets to be about 15 minutes to launch, things start to pick up speed, and you begin to just concentrate on your gauge readings, uh, what the ground's telling you, and getting ready for the launch. At launch time, when this main engines night ignite, you're watching the instruments, you're not thinking about anything except what is it that I'm seeing, is this right, and if it isn't right, what do I do? And that kind of mental attitude continues all the way through launch. So I feel fairly certain that the crew members, all during the first minute or minute and a half of launch, were looking at their gauges, listening to Houston, and thinking, it's going well, everything's going good, everything's going just like we hoped it would go. And my feeling personally is, that is what they thought all the time. Now this happened with such a suddenness, Alan Bean, and there was no indication, no one heard any indication, no one saw any indication that the spacecraft uh, was in any difficulty whatsoever. Uh, it, it, things happen so quickly in there. We're talking about seconds, and in some cases, nanoseconds. Uh, speculation, pure and simple. But would the commander and the pilot have had a gauge indication that something was wrong? One of the things that you do when you design spaceships, of course, is you try to design them so they never fail. And that doesn't work. So if that doesn't work, then you say, what parts can, uh, could possibly fail? Maybe a computer. Okay, we'll put five of them on board. How about the external tank? Well, we can't put five of those on board. They're too big. We better build the one we have and make sure it works. Don't bother putting a lot of instrumentation on there because if something does go wrong, there's nothing you can do anyway. So I feel that if it was a failure of the external tank or the solid rocket booster up in the middle of it somewhere, like Leo was talking about, that there's no instrumentation there that the crew can readily get an indication that something's going wrong. So from their point of view, from their perspective, Everything looks good. Uh, there were no ejection seats in this space shuttle. Uh, there were in some of the very earliest of the space shuttle uh, flights, there were ejection seats in the, in the crew area, but none in this one today. No, Dan, and my personal feeling as a result of what I just said is, even if this had been the first flight of the space shuttle, where John Young and Bob Crippen with ejection seats, that this kind of failure happened so fast, and apparently with no warning, uh, that they wouldn't have been able to use them. Uh, this kind of catastrophe uh, is not what the space seat, what the seats are uh, designed for. This is a, a catastrophe that just cannot be allowed to happen. In this case, of course, it did, and the engineers are going to go have to go back and take a look because this uh, there is no uh, crew member recourse for this kind of a failure. Uh, inside the, the, the cockpit of the space co capsule, is there flame resistant, flame retardant material in there? There is, but there's nothing that could uh, absorb the energy that is in either the solid rocket boosters. It looks like neither of them came apart because we could see them after the explosion, but there's certainly nothing in there that could absorb the uh, force of an explosion of the hydrogen and, uh, and oxygen that's in the tank. Nor, I might add, when this occurs, the shuttle would be put at a strange attitude relative to the air. It's going 2,000 miles an hour 
as you pointed out, maximum airflow, at maximum airspeed, uh, the shuttle would come apart. It just can't be built for that kind, those kinds of forces. This kind of failure cannot be allowed to occur when you design a spaceship. It's that and, simple. And there's every indication today that it uh, exploded in that great fireball almost instantly. Alan Beam, yes. thank you very much for being with us this evening. The seven-member crew of Space Shuttle Challenger was varied from different backgrounds with different training. But as Bruce Hall reports, what these heroes shared was the pursuit of excellence. And then it was going to be Krista McAuliffe's flight. The 37-year-old Concord, New Hampshire so school teacher, married, mother of two, had captured the attention of the nation. The she was going to be the first private citizen, not connected in any way to the space program, to be given a ride on the shuttle. She Thank was picked for more than 11,000 teacher too. applicants yeah. and was fiercely proud of representing her profession. I feel a great responsibility and excitement this year that I'm representing my profession. Well, Shuttle Commander Francis so Dick Scobie was happy to be part of the teacher they, mission. They, His uh, wife is a prominent educator, and he believed the space program needed the involvement of teachers and children. He was a space veteran who had flown aboard the Challenger in April 1984. And before leaving, he told friends that the future of mankind depended on flights like this to outer space. We have to expand into, the, into outer space to keep our hands on the resources we need to make the human race survive. So I think it's our survival eventually. The pilot was 40-year-old Mike Smith, a Navy commander and veteran of Vietnam. It was his first flight, and safety was his primary concern. My primary interest is to make sure that we get up and back safely. 36-year-old Judy Resnick was the second American woman to go in space, flying aboard the Challenger in August, 84. She was a classical pianist and had a PhD in electrical engineering. A research scientist, she was the only one aboard who was single. Ellison Onizuka and Ron McNair had gone through special training so they could take a walk in space to fix any emergencies that might occur aboard the shuttle. It was Onizuka's second flight. He was an aerospace engineer and a pilot who had spent much of his career teaching other pilots at the Elite Test Pilot School. 36-year-old McNair had a PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and was an expert in the field of lasers. It was his second trip into space. 41-year-old Greg Jarvis was overjoyed to finally get aboard the shuttle. He had been bumped twice, first by Senator Jake Garn and later by Congressman Bill Nelson. It was his first flight but he was the one who tried to relieve the pressure on the others. It was his idea to take Krista McAuliffe for a bike ride when she became restless following Sunday's postponement. It was a crew doing what they know best, a crew doing what they wanted to do in life. Bruce Hall, CBS News. As Bruce Hall mentioned, Senator Jake Garn, Cactus Jake Garn of Utah, flew in a shuttle mission. He was the senator who flew in one of the shuttle missions, followed, of course, uh, by a member of the House of Representatives. And Senator Garn has uh, just returned from talking to the families at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, he's been kind enough to take a, a moment or two at Andrews Air Force Base in suburban Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, to talk with us. Uh, senator Garn, is there anything uh, that you got from the families? Did they say anything to you that you feel you can or want to pass along? Well, I was fortunate enough to go with the Vice President and uh, Cong or Senator John Glenn to visit with the families. And obviously, it was a very difficult meeting. Uh, you always feel inadequate, and not knowing exactly what to say to try and comfort the families. The thing that I was so impressed with is Mrs. Scobie, the commander's wife, stood up when we came in and said, Mr. Vice President and Senators, I think I speak for all of the families here that we want you to know that we want the space program to continue. We don't want it delayed. We know that our loved ones would want it to continue and as tragic an accident as this has been and as sad as it is, don't let it stop the space program. It was very, very touching and very difficult for us. As any of us who've known them uh, knows, Senator Garn and as Tom Wolfe wrote so eloquently in his book, The Right Stuff, being a pilot's wife, a military pilot's wife, who some of these women uh, had been for a very long time, um, is trying under the best of circumstances to say nothing of circumstances in which your husband and the father of your children is going to ride a machine such as one of these space shuttles. You made that trip once. 
at about the one minute and 12 or 15 second mark, do you remember what you were thinking on your flight? Well, during that period of time, the solid rocket boosters burned for two minutes, and it's very rough, and it's very noisy. And so you, uh, thinking how exciting it is, how wonderful it is, is within a few more minutes, about another six minutes, you're going to be in orbit and be able to look back at the Earth. And when the two minutes are over, it dramatically smooths down. So you're relieved to get rid of the solid rocket boosters. They were about halfway to that point. I'm sure they were extremely excited, ecstatic about getting into space after being delayed a couple of days. I'm sure they were very happy and very excited at that point and thinking about what a wonderful, fantastic experience it would be in just a few minutes to be orbiting the Earth. Senator Garn, do you remember what you saw and what you heard at that moment? Were you praying? Did you have your eyes open or closed? What did you see and feel and hear? Well, at that moment, again, you're halfway through the solid rocket booster burn. As I remember, Charlie Walker, who was sitting next to me in the uh, mid-deck, were clapping and uh, shaking hands because we came within only 55 seconds of being canceled. And that was all we had left in our flight window for that morning. So we were cheering and clapping and shaking hands about that point into the flight. Senator Garn, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, I trust that you passed along, you and Vice President Bush, uh, the respect, uh, honor, and sympathy uh, of the nation to those families. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. We did. The stunned shock in the hometown of teacher Krista McAuliffe. The equally solemn and sad reaction in the Houston suburb where so many NASA astronauts and employees live. Clear Lake City, Texas, near the Johnson Space Center. Martha Teichner is there. The town where astronauts live and work closed ranks. There was no information. Just this sign, turn on your lights and pray for our astronauts. People did. An armed guard stood outside Mission Commander Dick Scobie's house tonight. The Johnson Space Center, where reporters are usually dished out data by the pound, got nothing. There were no news releases, no interviews. Nobody connected with the space shuttle was allowed to talk. A stunning, staggering silence was NASA's response to the tragedy that was inevitable someday. From those terrible minutes just after the launch, as the technicians who worked with the crew helped them in and out of their simulators, called them by their first name, Names realized what had happened. There was a compulsion to be near a television, to see the explosion replayed over and over. Tourists stood near NASA workers, their faces full of their feelings. Seven people snuffed, and the only thing good you can say about it is that they didn't feel it. But when you saw it, it totally was engulfed. My God, what a sight. One by one, the flags up and down NASA Road 1 were lowered to half-mast, and people stared at them, disbelieving. The walls at P.T.'s restaurant are covered with pictures of astronauts, including three members of the shuttle Challenger's dead crew. No astronauts came in tonight for dinner or happy hour. No, it just doesn't seem possible that they never come in here again. So far, mourning has been an individual matter. Here, where astronauts live and work, it is everybody's tragedy. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Clear Lake City, Texas. This horrible tragedy, this moment so vividly burned in our minds, it is one of those events that many of us are likely never to forget. Even now, many hours after we first saw that horrific ball of flame, it is hard to believe it happened at all. Bernard Goldberg looks at America's reaction to the deaths of seven of our own. T minus 15 seconds. In the American mind, it had become routine, all those successful launches. In reality, of course, it never was routine, not for all the Americans who would watch close up, and certainly not for the people who would ride the shuttle into space. No, it never was routine. And at 11.39 Eastern Standard Time this morning, the proof exploded before our eyes. You just can't believe that something like that has happened initially, and then when it sinks in, you know, you're just, it's just like, uh, you know, losing a member of your family. Today, our shock turns to sadness. We salute those who risked and gave their lives to serve our country at the last great frontier. And in the small towns around the Cape, this American tragedy was a community tragedy as well. This community has been a part of the Space Center and its progress. We've shared the joys, 
certainly today we've cha uh, shared a great tragedy. I was a school teacher myself for 31 and a half years, and I taught the age that she left, and it really touched my heart. I have grandchildren the same age. I was at first shocked because I didn't know what had happened and thought it was a dream that you'd wake up out of. They were pioneers with high hopes and old-fashioned courage. They made it look like fun. So, in the American mind, it was becoming routine. Of course, it never was. This is Bernard Goldberg. President Reagan had planned to deliver his State of the Union speech tonight, and at one point today, the president said he was going ahead with it. But he quickly uh, changed his mind just a bit later, and instead, as Leslie Stoll tells us, he scrapped the State of the Union speech, postponed it until next week for a special address today to a nation in a state of shock. President Reagan ordered all flags on public buildings flown at half-staff, proclaiming a week of national mourning, leading the country in what he called our pain. The president said, I just can't rid myself of the thought of the sacrifice and the families. The families of the seven, we cannot bear, as you do, the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. The president has taken a keen interest in the space program ever since 1982, when he was the honored guest at the happy landing of the shuttle Columbia. Ironically, the Challenger was flown overhead that day in a proud salute to the Commander-in-Chief. Despite the sorrow of today's tragedy, the President said the program will go on. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. It was President Reagan's idea to send civilians into space and to make a teacher the first. He spoke to the teacher completed. finalists in June. When one of you blasts off from Cape Kennedy next January, you will be representing that hope and opportunity and possibility. You will be the emissary to the next generation of American heroes. The President and Mrs. Reagan are here tonight at home, Mr. Reagan having postponed his upbeat State of the Union address. At first, he said he was going to go ahead with the speech because, and I quote, you can't stop governing the nation because of a tragedy of this kind. But then after congressmen, Republicans, and Democrats urged a cancellation, it was finally decided that the budget was not what most Americans want to hear about tonight. This is Leslie Stahl at the White House. From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore, a nation mourns seven heroes. From New Hampshire to Florida to Texas and beyond, they saw a space shuttle explode into smithereens. Seven lives lost just like that. The danger of space flight is real. That was real fire, real flames, and real death. But says President Reagan, we will continue our quest in space. Is it worth the risk? Has the space program come too far too fast? We'll examine those questions when our coverage of the Challenger disaster continues. This is CBS. Yes, News special report, Disaster in Space, continues. Here again is Dan Rather. It has been in recent years so easy to think of the space program as so many comfortable bus rides by technocrats so easy to forget that our astronauts were adventurers. As much as the Argonauts of Greek myth, as much as Sir Francis Drake and Lindbergh, adventurers riding a pillar of flame. And though the two and one half decades of manned space flight, there have been moments of terror and death. Almost exactly 19 years ago, January 27, 1967, a confident astronaut crew, Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee, they met death when fire swept their Apollo 1 command module during a ground test. In 1970, astronaut James Lovell floated in weightlessness, but then Apollo 13 exploded on the way to the moon. We had a main B bus underboat. 
an oxygen tank had been mishandled during manufacturing, Apollo 13 finally returned safely to Earth. The dangers of space travel apply to all. The Soviet Union, the only other nation to send manned vehicles into space, has reported the deaths of at least four cosmonauts. On October 12, 1964, a Soviet cosmonaut completed a successful 24-hour space odyssey, but in 1967, he would become the first person to die during a space flight when his Soyuz 1 crashed after re-entry. With us tonight in Colorado Springs, Colorado, is an authority on the Soviet space program. He is Nicholas Johnson, advisory scientist for Teledyne Brown Engineering. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for being with us. The Soviet Union, at last report, had reported today's American space disaster in one line. Does this put them ahead? Can it put them ahead? No, it doesn't put them ahead. And the, what do we, how much do we know about the Soviet accidents over the years? Now, I mentioned that uh, I know we're having some audio problems there, so and we hope those get cleared up for you. That uh, the Soviets reported, uh, have reported the deaths of four cosmonauts, but uh, you and others have uh, written that there's some reason to believe that they've had uh, more accidents than they've been, uh, been willing to make public. Well, we only understand that they've had four actual fatalities on two different missions about four years apart, the first in 67 and the second in 1971. But at four-year intervals, there have been three other near-fatal accidents, the last occurring in September 1983, when two cosmonauts almost suffered an identical fate to what happened today. The Soviets have, uh, have favored unmanned space exploration, have they not? Well, they've accomplished many things with manned space flight, to make uh, no mistake about it, but they've favored unmanned exploration. Well, if you look at the ledger, then certainly they have launched more unmanned spacecraft than we have but they've also launched more manned spacecraft, so percentage-wise, it's pretty much equal. They, uh, they don't use the same kind of propulsion system that we do uh, for launch and getting into orbit, though. No, they don't use the more exotic liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. They simply use liquid oxygen and kerosene, which dates back to the V-2 rockets of World War II. Uh, to, to have it clearly understood, the V-2 rockets used uh, more solid rocket fuel. Uh, well, no, uh, so go ahead. No, they were liquid fuels, but they were simply kerosene and oxygen and not liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And the, the technique, the knowledge of how to use liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen as we do in getting our space shuttles into orbit, the Soviets have that uh, technology and know-how, or they don't, or we don't know. They have never demonstrated it, but we believe they're working on three new vehicles, one very similar to the space shuttle, which will use exactly the same technique. Mr. Johnson, uh, when I asked you the question at the beginning where you had some trouble uh, hearing whether they, this could put the Soviets ahead, uh, you study the Soviet space program very closely and you have for a long time. It's always hard to make a comparison, but obviously, clearly, this is going to set back the U.S. space program. And what advantage will that be to the Soviets? Are they in a position to take uh, special advantage of that? I don't think it will give them advantages because we're not traveling the same path in space right now. They are concentrating on manned occupation of low altitude satellites. For the last six years, they've occupied that station for about half of each year. Uh, what we have been doing recently is simply deploying satellites and gaining new experience, which we lost in the late 70s. I don't think that this actually gives the Soviets an advantage. They're simply applying their techniques in a different manner. Mr. Johnson, we want to move on to other coverage, but why have the Soviets never put a man on the moon? They tried for a long while. Well, I think what happened, they were running very close behind us in 1968. And when we were successful with Apollo 8 around the moon in December of that year, then their program, which was a little bit farther behind, simply got canceled because they could not catch up quickly enough. Thank you very much, Nicholas Johnson, advisory scientist for Teledyne Brown Engineering. The space shuttle, a truck, a kind of flying workhorse, reusable and lately used for the first few times as part of the U.S. military space program. This brought something brand new to the whole space shuttle program, secrecy and news blackouts about U.S. military payloads. CBS News Defense Department correspondent David Martin reports it's no secret the Pentagon is no fan of the shuttle now more than ever. Later this year, the Space Shuttle Challenger was to have carried a top-secret military payload into space, one of five military missions scheduled for the Space Shuttle this year. 
Now that Challenger is no more, now that all shuttle flights are grounded indefinitely, Pentagon officials are scrambling to determine just what effect today's tragedy will have on the military's race into space. The Pentagon is counting on the shuttle to carry vital communications and intelligence satellites, as well as Star Wars experiments, into space. By the 1990s, officials foresee a need for 24 military space launches a year, more if a Star Wars defense against Soviet missiles is actually deployed. With that kind of schedule, the Air Force already has warned that if one of the shuttles were to be lost, quote, we could never catch up. If we have main engine start, we have a cutoff. Even before today's catastrophe, there were increasing doubts about NASA's ability to meet the Pentagon space needs. So the Air Force is hedging its bets by building new rockets to back up the shuttle. The first of the new rockets will not be ready until 1988. By then, the Air Force will have run out of these older Titan rockets, which it currently uses. Now it appears the Air Force will run out much sooner, as the rockets are used to fill the void left by the loss of Challenger. Officials say some of the damage to the military space program can be limited by the fact that the Pentagon has the power to bump scientific and commercial payloads from the shuttle. One way or another, Pentagon officials say they will figure a way to get all their satellites and experiments into space. But today's disaster will almost certainly add billions to the cost. This is David Martin at the Pentagon. This is the 25th year of manned space exploration, just 25 years. A mere speck of time, really. And we've gone from brief space flights to short turnaround space shuttles. We launch satellites and walk in space so routinely. But are we pushing the limit? Should we slow down? Joining us again from the Johnson Space Center uh, near Houston is former astronaut Alan Bean, also in our Washington CBS News studio. Congressman Mervyn Dimely, head of the Congressional Space and Technology Caucus, and here in New York, Myron Mocklin, a former director of the Space Shuttle Program. Gentlemen, what about it? Are we pushing the limit, and should we slow down? First, former astronaut Alan Bean. Dan, I don't think so. I think one of the things that I've noticed in NASA all the time I was there, some 18 years, was that they never compromised safety. They never pushed too hard because of cost, they never compromised safety because of any political pressure or anything. So I feel that whatever went wrong was a mistake and, and will be rectified. But I, I don't believe it was because NASA was pushing too hard. I feel they never go beyond the limit of, of safe operations. Congressman uh, Mervyn Dimele, uh, as head of the Congressional Space and Technology Caucus, uh, is, have the, the budget pressures on NASA been costly to us? And has that, has that been one of the things to, to, to put the pressure on the space agency? More than budget pressures. First, NASA has a, an excellent safety record, certainly better than the automobile industry, better than the aircraft industry. However, as your Pentagon correspondent just commented, NASA is under great pressure from the military, great pressure from the Congress, from the administration, from the private sector, and from the insurance industries. This uh, accident will, in, of course, increase insurance rates, and that's a pressure. And we are under pressure from possible co uh, competition from a consortium in Europe. So NASA is under great pressure from a number of sources to make these explorations profitable or self-supporting. And therefore, as a result of that, they have to meet a very rigid schedule. Any interruption that schedule throws the whole NASA program back and I believe that the time has come for us to just step back just a minute and reorder our scheduled priorities and try to slow down the program just a little bit you're not recommending or are you any reduction in NASA's budget you're saying let up a little on the schedule indeed uh, in fact NASA has done very well over the last five years they've had a, a net increase in their budget I believe that they're doing an excellent job. I think, however, the schedule is too much like the Washington, D.C., New York shuttle run. Uh, Myron Malkin here in New York, former director of the Space Shuttle Program. Uh, your view, an overview, and as objectively as you can, have we been moving too fast? Have the pressures been too great on the Space Shuttle schedule? Um, no, I don't, uh, I don't believe that we're moving uh, too fast. Um, I agree with uh, Alan Bean that um, the primary issue in NASA has always been safety, and the shuttle is designed with that thought in mind. The uh, exact um, uh, cause of this uh, of the disaster today 
has yet to be determined. Uh, the, um, it's necessary to uh, keep moving forward, um, and I don't believe that uh, we've compromised safety in any way in, uh, uh, at, the, at the present pace. The shuttle program has been set up and the manufacturing facilities and launch facilities have been constructed with uh, schedule uh, in, in mind as we proceeded forward, it's and I think they're adequate to, uh, to do that. Astronaut Alan Bean, uh, what about this report today? We, we're talking about safety and whether the pressure on NASA to get these launches, particularly after they've been delayed a time or two up there and out there and move on to the next one. Uh, when you were an astronaut, if someone had told you that there were icicles forming on the bottom of the spaceship, as happened this morning, uh, would you have been concerned about that, even if NASA said, well, we've looked it over and we've delayed for two hours, would that have been of concern to you? If someone mentioned it, I would say to myself, I wonder what having icicles on there means. And I would say, I know that back in Launch Control Center, they're checking with the experts on icicles, if you will, to see what he thinks, or the team that has, that's concerned with uh, temperature or the environment around the uh, spacecraft and the booster. And I would feel confident if they came back to me and said, icicles are okay, that they said that from a position of knowledge, testing, study. They didn't just look out the window and say, it ought to be okay, I think it's okay. They would have had data to, to prove it's okay or they wouldn't have gone. They'd have said, let's don't go, we'll do some testing and go some other day. And, and what about the report that uh, over the weekend that one of the cranes that help, uh, was helping to set up the shuttle launch accidentally bumped into one of the fuel tanks. Now, uh, Mr. Moore, the director, uh, current director of, of the Space Center, uh, today, this afternoon when asked that question said, well, yes, uh, in effect that happened, but we checked it out and, and we think everything was okay. Would that have been of concern to you? No, because once again, Mr. Moore has his own integrity plus the integrity of his team behind him. Believe me, uh, NASA operates as a close-knit family, like you said earlier in this program. And nobody is going to let anything go by that they feel is, is a safety consideration. Things that have bitten us before in the space program are things that we didn't know. We, didn't, we thought we knew and then they were wrong. We've never had a failure that I know of in the space program where people stood up and said, this needs to be fixed, it's going to be a failure later on, something's going to break, this is going to blow up. If they ever say that, we go study the problem and we solve it and we make sure finally that everybody agrees it's safe. So if you take a look back in the history of the space program, you'll find that things that have hurt us in the past have been things that we all agreed were okay and we found out later we would made a mistake. So I feel that that's what's going to happen here, that it's... It's not going to be something anybody knows about at this moment. Congressman Donnelly, uh, what about this business of allowing civilians, uh, politicians, school teachers, and journalists? Uh, school teacher uh, Krista McCall uh, McAuliffe, we all admire her, we all thrilled with her when she was chosen. But as we step back and look at it, uh, has that been premature, as uh, former astronaut Frank Warman suggested uh, at one time today? Well, I think it was perfectly uh, proper to have a school teacher on because what we are attempting to do is to explore the space and to bring this message back to our classrooms. The whole question of whether politicians ought to go reminds me very much of the uh, media hype we witnessed for the uh, Super Bowl. I don't think it is necessary for uh, politicians to go up. I think scientists, of course, should go up, and a teacher, in fact, is a scientist in his or her classroom. So I think that's a proper role for a teacher. Uh, former director of the Space Shuttle Program, Mr. Mocklin, uh, we earlier quoted a United Press International report saying that speculation, clearly underline that word, speculation uh, in the early investigation is focusing on the spacecraft's large fuel tank, that massive external fuel tank that's manufactured by Martin Marietta Aerospace uh, in Louisiana. Uh, do you have any uh, information on your own that would indicate that's true? And whether you do or not, what checks are made on these contractors for quality control? Um, I would say that um, the, there's no question that the, the source of uh, the major amount of energy that um, contributed to the explosion came from the external tank, but you can't, I would uh, be uh, very hesitant to indict that uh, element at this time. There's a lot of um, um, material to be gone over before we can decide that that is the case. Uh, the um, 
Um, the earlier uh, suggestion that was showing up in the films about those little uh, uh, flashes uh, from apparently coming from the solid rocket booster have to be examined very carefully uh, to determine whether or not those are the cause. As to the quality, the control that goes into um, uh, making the external tank, that's a welded aluminum structure. And there's about a kilometer of weld in that uh, tank. The, uh, uh, all the joints are x-rayed. And um, early on in the program, they were getting to a place where there was, um, um, I think, uh, less than an inch of um, uh, weld that had to be reworked. So I would not think that um, uh, that could be a problem. It's, we have to really wait for all the data to be examined to be to get a better idea of what's, uh, what's really happened. Mr. Walken, we know that we've had quality control programs and things such as nuclear submarines, wells uh, that, that are not uh, exactly and precisely made. And there's been, uh, many, there have been many complaints about the decline of craftsmanship and quality in the manufacture of American weaponry and things such as submarines and space shuttles. Now, surely you faced that when you were in your job as the director of the space shuttle program. Um, there is always uh, quality issues that are uh, dealt with, and you cannot say that uh, uh, everything is perfect. But the, um, the procedures that are in place to detect those things are um, um, excellent. Uh, I would, I, I can't be uh, categorically uh, say that it was not the tank. But uh, the, it's a relatively passive part of the, um, of the shuttle itself. It stores a lot of energy, but not a lot is going on inside the tank. The things that are going on that are very active and uh, is in the solid rocket boosters and in the main engines. And so that's a place that uh, everything will be examined. That's one of the places that I'm sure will be examined very carefully. Alan Bean, when astronauts get together to talk to, they discuss the possibility that uh, someone who made a weld, someone who put a bolt in place, might have been out late the night before, or might have been somebody's brother-in-law and got the job that way. Surely that must be a real and present fear with the astronauts. Well, we talk about it. We wonder if the people that sewed the parachutes, for example, all worked well, if they did the well, everything else. And NASA managers, uh, like Mr. Malkin talk, is one, talked about it, they know that too. They know people do have uh, off days. And so we've had to set up a system of check and balances in the space program to take into a, that into account. For example, someone does the job, then you have an inspector at that point, and then you have another inspector. Then but all three people agree that that is, let's say the weld is done properly. Then you take it down to the cape and you just assemble it. You have inspectors, once again, more than one to look at it, say that it's okay. Then you get it on the launch pad and then you test it. You put pressure in it. You overpressure it a little bit. You do all these different tests to ensure that the fella six months ago or a year ago back at the factory didn't make a mistake. And when these systems of checks and balances are finished, then I think everybody has confidence. I know we as astronauts always had confidence in the hardware. Thank you, uh, Alan Bean. Uh, Congressman uh, Dimely, how far, in your opinion, is the American space program set back now? Uh, a year, two years, less or more than that? I, I would say less than a year. There's no question in my mind the program must continue, and NASA has suffered a major setback. But I think one has to look at the human factor. To what extent is pressure uh, bringing about these uh, delays? to what extent is pressure causing these uh, technical difficulties one cannot ignore these human factors and it seems to me that we need to step back a, a bit and re-examine the whole procedure the whole scheduling process which brings stress and brings pressure onto the whole production of the program thank you very much congressman dimely uh, for being with us uh, tonight in the hometown of challenger astronaut ron mcnair lake city south carolina CBS News correspondent Sandy Gilmore visited the home of Matthew Brown, McNair's former teacher, and they were joined by a former classmate, but I, George Simmons. And did people get together, Mr. Brown, or what was the, what happened in town? Well, uh, people began to make calls and to get together, and of course, uh, as soon as we got the news as a school system, we 
call the administrators, principals, and ask them to have mass flags and uh, to pass the announcement around to student bodies and teachers. There is a, a Ron McNair Boulevard in town. There is a, a Ron McNair, a McNair Square. And uh, this is, is this the most famous person this town has ever, ever seen on a national basis? Truly, most definitely, I would say that, that, it, that it is. And uh, uh, Ron himself could not uh, uh, believe that this street would be changed from Boulevard to Ron McNair Boulevard. And Just a last question. What did the, what did the, what are the youngsters around here now, what's, what's their recollection of Ron McNair? Is he someone they look up to or? Definitely. He's a person that, you know, all, everybody from initially before the space shuttle, just that he would qualify to uh, be a, one of the NASA astronauts, uh, qualified him to be looked up to. And after he came and visited all the schools, this was one of his highest priority to go into the schools. And everyone from that point on knew that, you know, even though all the achievement that he had made, his priority were, you know, let's tell the children that the sky is the limit. Teacher Krista McAuliffe's hometown of Concord, New Hampshire, is a city of about 30,000, a city rich in American tradition. And tonight, Charles Osgood reports, Concord is a city in mourning. There are places in this country tonight, and Concord, New Hampshire is one of them, where what happened today is being taken not so much as a public event, but as a personal loss. A part of each and every one of us also boarded that space shuttle. And so only natural, naturally, we feel that a part of us is gone. My soul is longing for your peace. All over Concord tonight, there were church services where people prayed for their friend and neighbor, Krista McAuliffe, and for her family and fellow astronauts. And we, not understanding, are inconsolable. The same thoughts were being expressed everywhere in Concord, in the stores and streets, and on the radio. This one thing was on everyone's mind. Many of us were watching as the craft exploded. Along with the sense of loss, however, is the feeling that this teacher, this warm, compassionate woman, has taught us something, even in death. And others will dare to do more and to take her place because of the example of Krista and those who perished with her today. On the front door of the house right next door to the McCullers is a wreath with a picture Krista sent to Jean Timmons, one of the eight Timmons children. On the picture, Krista wrote a little note to Jean, and this is what she said. She said, may your future be limited only by your dreams. Charles Osgood, CBS News. CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite was present at the creation of the American Space Age, covering this nation's space program through the sunshine and the showers, from its faltering beginnings through tragedy to the triumph of man on the moon and beyond. He filed this reflection on today's catastrophe from Santiago, Chile. Even in our moment of such deep grief, we must look ahead to the future, for such is the nature of life. There will be, of course, long investigations and examinations of what happened today at Cape Canaveral. The argument will be buttressed for those who have been opposed to manned spaceflight all along. They'll now add the question of safety to their arguments. And NASA, of course, their engineers will have to look very carefully at what happened today to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Those of us who have watched the development of our space program from the very beginning, long before man first essayed a trip into space, we saw a lot of rockets blow up on the pad, soar into space, and then be destroyed. And I think in the backs of our minds always was locked the fear that someday all that volatile fuel would get loose when man was aboard, as indeed happened today. 
America's pride in what it has accomplished in space in more than a quarter of a century of safe manned flight should not be diminished by today's terrible uh, tragedy. We have come a long way in space, and there's still so much to be done out there. There are scientific, industrial, medical bounties to be reaped in space. To diminish what we have done in the past would be to dishonor those who lost their lives in that program on Challenger today. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News, Santiago, Chile. A CBS News program reminder, we'd like to remind you that the CBS Morning News will continue our coverage live tomorrow morning from Cape Canaveral, Florida with Forrest Sawyer and Maria Shriver. Why do they do it? What do they die for? Francis Scobie, spacecraft commander, veteran of a previous Challenger flight. Scobie talked about it in 1984. You have to risk something to gain something. And the risk and the gain are worth it to me. I'm, I thoroughly enjoy doing what I'm doing. And if you allow risks to keep you from doing the things in life that, that pleasure you and, and make you what you are and make you feel better about yourself, I think you're shortchanging yourself. Do you think we'd ever accomplish anything without taking some sort of risk? No. You might as well just go in the bedroom, close the door, and turn out the lights. They were 10 miles high when they died today, just like the old days of test pilots of the right stuff showing their stuff. But it was not like the old days of out on the edge, seat of the pants flying with flyers all cut from the same cloth. These were Americans from all walks, from all backgrounds. Fighter pilots with war records, payload specialists with degrees, men, women, a teacher of children, a mother. They were Christian, they were Jewish, they were humankind up there going for us. Going for the brass ring, for the thrill, for the knowledge, for the future. In a paraphrase of the poet James Dickey's work, put them high on the list of men and women who counted these searchers and seekers, these astronauts and teachers who died today in what became the spaceship disaster. They died in the blue and silver furnaces of their spacesuits. Think about them, who they were and the way they were. Dreamers, explorers, adventurers forcing themselves past the point of danger and deep fatigue to expand our understanding of what is up there and out there. They may never have known the nature of the trouble that killed them. For them, no more cries of, wow, what a view, no more jokes with mission control, no more thumbs up for cheering crowds, no more phone calls from the president. They will not see their parents and their wives or husbands and the children meeting them. Gone with the rush of the engines and the exploding sky. Gone, but theirs were lives that mattered. This has been a CBS News special report. Disaster in space. This is CBS. This place, not Cape Canaveral or the Houston Space Center, was the center of Krista McAuliffe's life. This house where she lived with her husband and children. This church where they worshipped. This school where she taught. No school today at Concord High. All classes were canceled. In this room, Mrs. McAuliffe used to teach her social studies classes. And whether it was economics or history or law, she taught her special theme about how individual, ordinary people could make a difference in the world. And the students who sat in these chairs remember what she said. She just kept telling us that you can do anything you want to do, you know, as long as, as you really try for it. You know, you're just going to have to go in face first and you know, sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose, but you just still have to give it a shot. I don't think that people will, will remember the explosion as much as they'll remember her for what she was. Back home in Concord now, with the parents who are their escorts, are the small children, third graders, who were at the Cape yesterday to watch classmate Scott McAuliffe's mommy go into space. And they would watch, and they would cry, and they would turn to the adults, and... Thankfully, there were enough adults so that every child had a lap and every adult had somebody to cuddle. I'm going to show you what the most important thing is that a parent does to help us. Look at me. Give me a hug.
that feel good? Yes. That's right. Okay. That's exactly what God does for you and me. There was a special church service today for 240 children from kindergarten through eighth grade. And remember, no matter how sad we feel, don't be afraid to say that to people. If you feel it's important to cry, then cry. If it's important to hug someone, then hug someone. And that's probably the most that we can do for one another right now. Dear Lord, I want to pray for Krista and all the crew. I want to pray for the families that are having a hard time right now. The astronauts are in heaven with God. Charles Osgood, CBS News, Concord, New Hampshire. Technology tests now on indefinite hold to a wondrous space-based telescope that can peer to the edge of the universe, now still bound to Earth, to unmade medicines because they can only be processed in zero-gravity space, to huge hikes in space industry insurance rates. The fireball that consumed Challenger is today ripping through the fabric of American life and American business. David Martin has the first of our reports tonight about what else was lost when the Challenger was lost. With this new launch complex at Vandenberg Air Force Base nearing completion, NASA and the Pentagon were gearing up to 24 shuttle missions a year. Now, with only three orbiters remaining, they are limited to 18 a year. Measure that against the nation's projected space needs for 1992, military and intelligence satellites, Star Wars research, NASA planetary probes, construction of a space station. Simple arithmetic says something's got to give. Informed sources tell CBS News that a Pentagon contingency plan prepared last year called for building a new orbiter in the event of a catastrophe in the shuttle program. That would take five years and cost two billion dollars. In the meantime, the Pentagon has no choice but to follow what one source called a, quote, high-risk space strategy. The Air Force has a limited supply of rocket boosters that can take up some of the slack. We have a uh, capacity to shoot probably about uh, eight to nine Titans and uh, Atlas E boosters a year out of here. But unlike the shuttle, these rockets cannot carry heavy payloads. The Pentagon has the clout to bump scientific and commercial payloads from the shuttle. When it comes down to a question of wh what you uh, give priority uh, to, that uh, we are likely to uh, fly the uh, defense missions uh, rather than some others. But of course, that causes some problems in some of those other areas, which are also a hope for the future. A Pentagon spokesman said today the Challenger tragedy will have a, quote, serious impact on the military space program. One Air Force officer called it a nightmare, and that's assuming no further delays in the shuttle program. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. 1986 was to have been a banner year for space science. An ambitious schedule for the shuttle, remarkable probes like Voyager's flyby of the planet Uranus with amazing images transmitted to Earth. And now, a year in doubt. I am concerned with regard to the effect of the loss of, of Challenger uh, on the, and the de inevitable delay on the succeeding missions uh, which are planned. Already lost, a Halley's mission. Special telescopes aboard the March 6th Columbia flight were to have provided a rare close-up of the comet's tail. It was a year that all space scientists had been looking forward to in terms of the new opportunities. In jeopardy and facing at least a year's delay, the joint American-European satellite survey of the sun's poles to have been carried aloft May 15th by the now-destroyed Challenger. And just one week later, NASA's Galileo project to have been started on its way to Jupiter by the shuttle Atlantis. Both projects can be launched only once every 13 months. Just one more nail in the coffin, I guess. Uh, that was a particularly tragic one because people got killed, but uh, it's, uh, it has the same effect. That shuttle cost money. In Pasadena, at a conference planning space projects for the early 21st century, scientists said the long-term concern for lost science is tempered by the loss of the Challenger crew. The experiment, said one scientist, seem rather small. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Pasadena. For all its outer space glamour, Challenger was really a workhorse, one of whose jobs was to speed the multi-billion dollar commercial use of space, a project that now may face tough going. I think that the entire uh, program, space program, will be set back uh, three or four years uh, before it comes back to the schedule that had been planned. That could hurt the commercial race in space, a $500 million a year industry. 
It could also slow up business for big NASA contractors, as well as for hundreds of smaller firms trying to get a foothold in space. Two, five, Some shuttle users may now turn to Ariane, the European unmanned rocket that has had problems, but operates with fewer delays. Many customers of the American shuttle uh, are going to be delayed. They probably go back to other type of launches. The shuttle was also designed to service this, the $12 billion space station scheduled to be built in the 1990s. Weightlessness could make possible the design and manufacture of all kinds of new products, estimated to be worth $65 billion a year by the year 2000. Challenger's problems could delay this project as well. But here, amid the financial chaos where billions of dollars trade every day, there was a rare moment of silence today for the Challenger 7. Ray Brady, CBS News, New York. versus the idea of the use once and throw away rocket to put people and payloads into space. Should we use people at all when our robot eyes and ears can see and hear so much so far away? How safe is safe? These questions about our space program haven't been asked so widely for years. Bob Schieffer reports these questions and more are being asked again now. As NASA's shuttle lifted off yesterday morning, another NASA project, an unmanned weather satellite, was busy mapping sections of the Florida coast from space. It caught the tragic final seconds of Challenger's flight, a tragedy that has brought to a boil questions about the space program that have been on the back burner for years. There's going to be a lot of shots taken at NASA uh, from all quarters. Here she comes, looking good. The shuttle's spectacular space shows and the idea it was all safe enough to take civilians along for the ride caught the public's fancy. But it overshadowed the debate in the scientific community on whether taxpayers really got a lot more for their money from unmanned probes. And today the debate was on again. Most of the things that we are now doing in space, we can design machines to do more cheaply and surely much safer. A person is still the best all-around general purpose computer that we've ever invented. Both critics and NASA supporters openly question the decision to take civilians like teacher Krista McAuliffe along. Every one of those seats should go to someone in training to make sure that, uh, that we get the maximum experience on every flight. It's too risky and too expensive uh, and has uh, looks too much, just like a stunt, really. With 15 flights more than ever, 1986 was also supposed to be the year that NASA answered critics who said the shuttle's frequent launch delays made it too unreliable to put payloads in space. Instead, the accident has revived old doubts and raised new ones. We ought to slow down on the schedule. There is no need to rush. For the first time in, in these explorations, we don't have the Russians to blame for speed. We've got to reevaluate how we're using the shuttle. We've got to quit trying to compete with unmanned, expendable rockets. After the 1967 fire that took three astronauts' lives, it was almost two years before America was able to put another person in space. Whatever the current investigation finds, it now seems certain that the entire space effort is about to undergo its toughest scrutiny yet from both scientists and Congress. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. saw and heard and read about the spaceship tragedy today. They discussed it with their friends and they shared in our sorrow. From the Soviet Union, our arrivals in space and on the Earth, official words of sorrow. A newscaster reads a telegram from Mikhail Gorbachev. We partake of your grief at the tragic death of the crew, Gorbachev tells President Reagan. And from the citizen in the street, a sense that we all have been diminished. Uh, I think it's a tragedy. For not only for American people, but all the people in the world, I think. A Japanese astronaut says, I don't feel like riding the shuttle at this point. She was to ride Challenger in 1988. The world feels deep pain, says the Pope. He adds, I offer a fervent prayer to God to accept the spirits of these courageous pioneers. Millions of school children were watching television yesterday when fire lit the sky and in one terrible burst ended the lives of the Challenger astronauts. What about the children? 
It was a question asked soon after the disaster, and tonight Bob Simon reports it is a question with many answers. In schools across the nation, it was to have been a fun learning experience, the ultimate field trip. It took a while to realize what the flash in the sky really meant. But a flash in the sky has always meant revelation of a sort. What was revealed to our kids? Well, that spaceships aren't magic, for one thing, that what you see on television is sometimes real. That sometimes a bad dream wasn't a dream at all. I was surprised. I was still kind of wondering, like, maybe they were wrong or something. When I woke up this morning, I was hoping it was a dream yesterday instead of it really happening. And in this science high school in the Washington suburbs, kids learned a lesson that was not on the program. Something about how what has always seemed safe and stable and strong is really horribly vulnerable. Something about how they'll never again be able to trust technology quite as blindly as they did until yesterday. I think that you really can't take anything for granted. That there's always a risk that something might happen. It doesn't mean it's going to happen on the next one, but there's still a possibility to that kid. When you start different teachers practice. use different ways today to help their kids through the experience. In Los Angeles, they wrote essays. I felt very depressed and sad, and I feel sorry for those students who lost a teacher. In Columbus, Ohio, counselors talk to kids. If we can make mistakes, we learn from the mistakes, and we go on. But it often turned out that the kids were tougher than we were. They didn't need counseling. We did. Students have been very supportive of the teachers, uh, maybe more so than the other way around. We had forgotten that our kids were born when man was already on the moon, that they'll never know, as we know, what a miracle space travel really is. It shouldn't be that much different than people dying in a like, plane crash or something like that, because they're still people. Don't ask big questions. Just fix the tire and keep on going. Yeah, I think you should look it over, see what's, see what's wrong, correct it, and then go, go back up. How many of you would still go up in a space shuttle and feel comfortable with that? But in this California classroom, a split decision. We adults always knew the world can be dangerous, unpredictable, and sad. That's what it means to be grown up. Our kids grew up a little yesterday. Bob Simon, CBS News, Washington. In memory of the Challenger 7, Dan Rather, CBS News, New York. We'll see you here again tomorrow. Good night. This is CBS. CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Day three, late word tonight that Coast Guard searchers and sonar sweeps off the coast of Florida have located large pieces of debris from the doomed space shuttle Challenger, including parts of the cockpit. And the National Transportation Safety Board, the agency that investigates airplane disasters, has been called in now to help investigate this space plane disaster. Our coverage begins with Bruce Hall. The search by the Navy and Coast Guard may have turned up major portions of the Space Shuttle Challenger late this afternoon. It looks like part of the fuselage to them. They report it as a large piece. They report seeing in the same area several other items that look to them to be parts of the cockpit. In the same search area, 35 miles off of Daytona Beach, sonar surveys show other large objects on the ocean floor, possibly parts of the craft. Earlier pieces found on the surface included a control panel and a case of tape recorders believed to belong to the astronauts. And along the beach, a fragment of a human bone. It will be examined and uh, identification will try to be made of it. Civilian voters are still being warned of fumes leaking from the wreckage. Extremely dangerous and highly toxic. If sighted, remain upwind of vapor or debris. There is a growing feeling among national rocket experts that a close inspection of the pictures of the external tank, the large main fuel tank attached to the shuttle, may indicate a problem that could have caused the explosion. So I think it was a, uh, a uh, small leak, probably uh, near, the, near the connector between the uh, external tank and the shuttle. NASA technicians continue poring over the computer data at Johnson Space Center. 
it is a painstaking search for any type of clue. If things that don't look as they should, you begin to accumulate those and hope eventually that a pattern begins to emerge. And, um, uh, and it's, a, it's a classic uh, case of uh, detective work is what it is. To help in the recovery, NASA sought the assistance today of the National Transportation Safety Board, the experts in determining the causes of airplane crashes. Two top NTSB investigators arrived this afternoon. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. And it has cleared the tower. Sources say that while NASA is prepared for every possible space flight contingency, the agency is poorly prepared to handle a major accident investigation. And it is not an easy job, and some things may never be found. Bits and pieces of the shuttle Challenger fell over an 8,000 square mile area. Recovery has been left up to the Navy and Coast Guard. We're picking up everything we can find and any determination as to what's significant and be made by NASA. Sources say the NTSB was called into the investigation because of concern that evidence was being destroyed in the recovery process. One source at the NTSB says that NASA called and basically said, help. The NTSB specializes in aircraft accidents. Its investigators are skilled in recovering and analyzing pieces of wreckage. It is often months before the cause of an accident is known. Reporters at the Kennedy Space Center are now painfully aware of that fact. As far as when exactly it will be named, I don't know. And I really can't add anything to what's already been said. For sure, it's frustrating. Well, when are we going to learn? The world is waiting for that answer, which may be months away. It is hoped the NTSB aircraft turned spacecraft investigators will help shorten the waiting time. Peter Van Sant, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. While the pace of investigation picked up, the pace of life was hardly back to normal. Somehow, said one of the relatives of one of the seven who died, somehow it hurts more today than it did yesterday. The students of Krista McAuliffe seem to feel that too today. No, it's not over for anyone. And it won't be for a long time. They also released seven black balloons into the air. The air that claimed the seven men and women of Challenger. The parents of Krista McAuliffe attended a memorial today at the Teachers College where their daughter graduated in 1970. The husband of Krista McAuliffe issued a statement today saying, we wish we could comfort all of you as you have comforted all of us. Krista McAuliffe, astronaut, teacher, ordinary citizen, remembered by her hometown today for her extraordinary life. She died an extraordinary death. She had her son's stuffed green frog, a daughter's cross and chain, a grandmother's watch with her when she died 10 miles high formally and officially as a nation. There will be a focal point, a ceremony at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The families of the fallen astronauts will be there. Their larger family, all of us, will be there too, watching. But for today, the morning was still a very individual, personal act, person by person. Very ordinary and therefore so special. In the spirit of leave a light burning for me, there were porch lights left on as modern-day memorials for the dead. More flowers than anyone could count, large bouquets, small arrangements, an outpouring of flowers began arriving. Some addressed to NASA, to the astronauts, as a group, as individuals. There were many who chose not to say it with flowers, but to say it with letters, student to student, letters from students to students in Krista McAuliffe's school. In Connecticut, students who wrote to Teacher McAuliffe before her mission got a letter just yesterday that she wrote before her death. She sent photographs, she sent good wishes, she told them to reach for the stars. When she said reach for the stars, I think she meant that we should keep our dreams and keep going towards the stars. In the sky over the landing strip in the California desert that so often said welcome home to shuttle missions, a flyby today to say goodbye to the Challenger craft and crew. And back at the Johnson Space Center today, astronaut training resumed, knowing full well that tomorrow the same space center will be the center of the grief that is, as well as the future that will be. We'll be broadcasting from Houston tomorrow to bring you live coverage of that tribute to the crew of Space Shuttle Challenger. For today and in memory, that's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting from New York.
See you tomorrow. Good night. Space Center Houston, a flyover salute in the sky, a hug for a newly fatherless child. America mourns its seven Challenger heroes, even as more debris is yielded by the sea, more evidence of a mission and a rescue that couldn't be. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting tonight from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. This has been an historic day of emotion and remembrance here. Gathered together in mourning, the men and women of the Space Agency, the President and the First Lady, and families of the Space Shuttle crew. They gathered in a soft wind and under a warm Texas sun for a memorial service that was solemn and reflective and profoundly touching. There were thousands of space agency people who'd helped train the Challenger crew here, who'd worked with them and joked with them. There were the families of the crew, mothers, fathers, children. And for a few poignant moments, grieving families, the first family, stories of and the huge extended family that is NASA and the nation, all remembered. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans. To those they left behind, the mothers, the fathers, the husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, yes, and especially the children. All of America stands beside you in your time of sorrow. The sacrifice of your loved ones has stirred the soul of our nation. And through the pain, our hearts have been opened to a profound truth. The future is not free. The story of all human progress is one of a struggle against all odds. Man will continue his conquest of space to reach out for new goals and ever greater achievements. That is the way we shall commemorate our seven Challenger heroes. Dick, Mike, Judy, L, Ron, Greg, and Krista. Your families and your country mourn your passing. We bid you goodbye. We will never forget you. Ended, many of the space agency workers in the crowd who've dreamed and reached for the stars for so long reached to console each other. And all day long, the flowers arrived here from around the country, from so many others, remembering. Tonight, the flowers are still coming. Here on the grounds and in the hangars of the Space Center, there are mock-ups of the flowers of the shuttle fleet for illustration, for practice, to get ready for real. And they are important for understanding what happened to Challenger. Within minutes of today's memorial, members of the disaster investigating team held a formal meeting, getting right back to the task at hand. Off the Florida coast, more new evidence was being pulled from the sea. Still more was being detected, but so far unreachable beneath the waves. Bruce Hall has the latest on the search. Recovery boats are continuing to find vital pieces of wreckage some of them from Challenger's important cockpit section, floating on the surface more than 30 miles off the coast of Daytona Beach. It looks to me like it might be the, the piece of the shuttle underneath the windshield. As wreckage is spotted by helicopters, smoke bombs are being dropped to mark the spots. Small boats move in and pick up the debris. 
Every hour that passes disperses the debris more and more. Investigators say some of the larger pieces have significantly aided the search for a cause of the explosion. The pieces brought to shore include a large section from the front of the fuselage, just below the cockpit, a long broken section of one payload bay door, an eight-foot part from the rear of one wing, and a hollow section of similar size forward on the wing. The discovery of such large pieces leads some investigators to believe that even bigger fragments of Challenger may rest on the ocean floor. Underwater robots are being called in by NASA to look at one large piece found by sonar. There are almost as many theories on the cause of the accident as there are pieces of debris. Theories ranging from the failure of the external tank or solid rocket boosters to a new one, upper level wind shear causing structural damage. I could probably generate 25 scenarios right now that would all fit what we saw on the TV. And all of them have to be investigated. One TV image today, a section of debris recovered that was designed to guide recovery teams in saving the astronauts during an emergency on land or sea. Bruce Hall, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. It's ironic that this is the largest piece of wreckage found so far. It's a piece of equipment designed to blow open an escape hatch to rescue the four people on the flight deck in an emergency. You can see how small the piece is next to the Challenger itself. It's a tiny part of a huge and complicated puzzle that investigators are trying to piece together. Here in the simulator with the astronauts trained, you can see that same piece of wreckage from the inside here on the mid deck of the Challenger, below the flight deck the mid-deck where Gregory Jarvis sat here, school teacher Krista McAuliffe there, and over there, mission specialist Ellison Onizuka. We'll have more later in the broadcast on the National Memorial Service from Houston, but first, the rest of the day's news after this. always be hard to bear. Coast at the Space Center, the focal point of today's sorrow and memory, but there were many memories and many ways of sorrow in many different places across our land. But Art Goldberg surveys landscapes of healing and sadness. <laughs> They came from seven different places in America, from small towns in the south, from snowy villages in the northeast, from the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest, from Hawaii. This was a day for hanging black ribbons in Lake City, South Carolina, the town where Ron McNair grew up, McNair's buddy, LaRue Alford. He inspired so many people by doing this, and it inspired everyone around the community, young folks, old folks, black and white. He's the greatest hero that we ever had to come through here. It was a day for remembering in Auburn, Washington, too, Dick Scobie's hometown, his lifelong friend, Phil Hagen. Francis R. Dick Scobie, commander of the Challenger. I was watching it, and my heart just dropped out. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> they remembered Ellison Onizuka in Kona, Hawaii. They cried for Krista McAuliffe in Concord, New Hampshire. You couldn't realize what kind of nice person she was until you heard people say that stuff. Okay. 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 Oh. All right. All right. We shall commemorate our seven Challenger heroes. The kids watched and the teachers cried in Beaufort, North Carolina. This is where shuttle pilot Mike Smith went to school. This is where the dream was born. Everyone was caught up in a spirit ready to burst forth in celebration because this young man is just such a classic example of a guy who had a dream, who had an ambition, and, and he was on the threshold of fulfilling it. And they paid their final respects to Judy Resnick in a synagogue in Akron, Ohio. It was as if Judy heard an inner voice constantly challenging her to greater achievements, to climb higher. As if the voice was telling her, remember, it's not what we are, but what we want. It's not what we are, but what we want to be. In a tiny village in the foothills of the Adirondacks, at the cozy Nook Diner in Mohawk, New York, 
They were sad, but they were also proud. Greg Jarvis was one of their own. No, for a small town, it's quite a feat to have somebody make it and go as far as he did. You come from a small town, you come from a small school, but you still can make it to the top. You can, you can be one of the best. Tonight, in Concord, New Hampshire, they are remembering their school teacher who perished with the others, seven Americans who came from seven different places, drawn to the same place by just one dream. Bernard Goldberg, CBS News, New York. In Space Center, the brain and blood of so much of our nation's space program, we heard kind words and warm memories for six astronauts, one teacher, seven Challenger heroes who died. Perhaps we should close this week not with our words for them, but with their words for us the mission, the quest, in this week that tore us apart and brought us together as one. 90 seconds and counting, the 51L mission ready to go. I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore as far as he can, as deep as he can into the unknown. T minus one minute and counting. Sound suppression water system now. I'm very proud and humble to have been a part of the space program. I think there is an awful lot to be done. The space shuttle is probably the most versatile vehicle we could have to do that. T minus 45 seconds and counting. The solid rocket booster flight in. It's a great pleasure finally to get this far. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, very proud to be part of the program at NASA. And the mission is a, is a great mission. We're looking forward to it, and I think we understand it's ready to go, and we're looking forward to going to fly. T-minus 30 seconds, and we've had a go for auto sequence start. One of the things that I hope to bring back into the classroom is to make that connection with the students that they too are part of history, that the space program belongs to them, and to try to bring them up with the space age. T minus 15 seconds. Commander Dick Scobie now uh, in the White Room. You have to risk something to gain something, and the risk and the gain are worth it to me. If you allow risks to keep you from doing the things in life that, that pleasure you and, and make you what you are and make you feel better about yourself, I think you're shortchanging yourself. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, roll, Challenger. Challenger, go at throttle up. And so tonight, a pivotal point in our national healing process. Remembering the fire that consumed seven of our own and one mighty machine. Remembering, too, the inner fire, the passion that helped them rush headlong to meet the future. They belong to the future now and to our own treasured past. For CBS News, Dan Rather at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. We'll see you Monday. Good night. This is CBS. When this agency tonight released new footage of the last 15 seconds of Challenger's flight, clearly showing a plume of flame coming from the right solid rocket booster seconds before the explosion. The new video appears to show that flames burned through the body of the solid rocket booster. Experts have suggested that misdirected fire detonated the volatile fuel in the shuttle's external tank or main fuel tank. This also indicates that the seven astronauts had no warning that the shuttle was going to explode. NASA officials caution that final conclusions should not be drawn from the new pictures. The cause is still unknown, and neither the board nor NASA 
will speculate as to the cause or effects of this observation. NASA impounded these pictures immediately after the accident. Officials here would not say why the crucial evidence has been withheld from the public until now. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. And rather reporting. Prime responsibility for investigating the space shuttle disaster today was taken away from NASA, instead replaced by a new panel appointed by President Reagan, quote, with no ax to grind either way. This panel is to report back within 120 days. Today, attention is still focused on why one of the shuttle's solid rocket boosters may have failed in flight, and CBS News was told of pre-flight concerns about maintenance and monitoring of these most powerful rocket engines ever built. Bruce Hall and Peter Van Sant have the latest on the investigation, one week and counting. President Reagan named a Blue Ribbon Presidential Commission this afternoon to find the cause of last week's catastrophe. As we move away from that terrible day, we must devote our energies to finding out how it happened and how it can be prevented from happening again. The commission, led by former Secretary of State William Rogers and former astronaut Neil Armstrong, will report within four months. In Florida, more partial human remains have washed ashore and are being examined to determine if they are from the seven astronauts. At sea, the surface search by Navy and Coast Guard vessels is being scaled back, but private boats are still finding pieces of the shuttle from South Carolina to Central Florida. Stop marking the shuttle tile on shuttle tile. Among the new debris recovered, another section of the wing, a portion of an aileron or air brake, and parts of a satellite assembly that was in the cargo bay. So far, 15 tons have been brought in, just a small fraction of the total puzzle. Three robot submarines are now searching the ocean floor, looking for parts of Challenger's crew compartment and sections of the crucial right solid rocket booster, which may have caused the accident. NASA investigators spent the day analyzing a film which appears to show a steadily growing rupture along or near a seam where steel pins hold together sections of the solid rocket booster. Aerospace experts believe the flames from that booster had the effect of a blowtorch on the main tank, eventually heating and igniting the highly volatile fuel. Now the emphasis is shifting to finding the cause for that rupture. Theories under investigation include a faulty seam, metal fatigue in parts used on previous shuttle launches, and fuel that may not have performed properly in freezing temperatures. I have a gut feeling that the burning through and the creation of the hole was somehow related to the cold weather the night before the accident. NASA revealed today that all but one part of the rocket which failed had flown on previous shuttle flights. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. NASA's investigation centers on why the right solid rocket booster failed. A former test engineer who was in charge of solid rocket booster inspections, Richard White, says the reusable rockets have a history of problems. Example, the umbrella-shaped cone at the bottom known as the aft skirt. There are problems with the aft skirt. There are definite cracks and corrosion problems happening. White says the skirts are damaged when they land in the sea after launch. He says engineers then perform a visual check of the rockets and repair what problems they can see. But White says many problems can only be detected with x-rays, and NASA doesn't have that capability. Some parts of the aft skirt have been disassembled, and some other you know, pieces of corrosion and, and cracks and things have been found uh, that uh, were not seen just by vis visual inspection. You cannot see through this with your eye. In 1984, White produced this video to show NASA officials the need for X-ray inspection of solid rocket boosters. He pointed out cracks that could not be detected any other way. White's X-ray inspection proposals were rejected for budgetary concerns. A spokesman for Morton Thiokol, the company that makes the solid rocket fuel, says X-ray inspection is not needed. The other types of inspection that are accomplished fully reveal the condition of the metal prior to the next use. Challenger's crew never knew their shuttle was in serious trouble. The three sensors on each rocket never detected the fatal problem, despite the fact that the second flame burned about 15 seconds prior to the explosion. Had they been warned, some spaceflight experts believe the crew could have attempted an escape. It would be time, in my opinion, to have separated the boosters away from the, uh, the rest of the spacecraft. NASA officials doubt the crew could have survived. Once Challenger broke away, it would somehow have to escape the fiery rocket exhaust. Challenger would then have to land at sea, striking the surface at an estimated 220 miles per hour. NASA says it would likely break up and sink. One astronaut said, when there's a failure in one of the solid rockets, it's just curtains. 
Peter Van Sant, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. New is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. A dramatic turn tonight in the space shuttle disaster investigation. CBS News has learned that searches and sonar sweeps appear to have turned up part of the Challenger's main crew quarters and belongings of some of the seven who died. Also believe found at the bottom of the Atlantic what could be a key piece of evidence to what went wrong. Bruce Hall has the details. If so, we're recovering our uh, submersible at this time. We'll be weighing Searchers have apparently found at least a portion of the shuttle's main crew compartment, which is still on the ocean floor, some of the personal effects of the astronauts, and a portion of one of the crucial solid rocket boosters. Up some items from the, the uh, special cabin uh, in this immediate location. Uh, so um, uh, under the theory that this stuff is coming up uh, from the bottom, uh, NASA officials refuse to comment on the findings. However, some of the material from the cabin is apparently floating to the surface. The important underwater discovery was made by a small robot submarine. Robot submarines were repeatedly lowered today to the ocean floor to search for the crew compartment. And the bubbles, uh, that's what we're facing the sonar. NASA officials did announce this afternoon they have sonar soundings that indicate one of the solid rocket boosters has been found but no attempt has been made to lift it from the ocean floor. Before the Navy pulled out today, the search area extended over 65,000 square miles, but now has been scaled back to 12,500. However, some of the floating debris is in the Gulf Stream, and officials expect to find small pieces of wreckage as far north as Nova Scotia. There is confusion here on the status of NASA's Interim Investigation Board, which appears to have been put out of business by the appointment of a presidential commission. Still, the analysis of computer information collected before and during the flight continues. At Johnson Space Center, sources say the computer did detect a 5% drop in power in the right solid rocket booster, but that information was not seen by mission controllers. During Challenger's brief flight, it sent down more than 4,000 bits of information a second. However, only about 10% of that information appears on the screens of mission controllers. The remaining 90% is shunted aside to storage computers. Sources say a review of the computer data indicates the booster's power drop was not considered serious enough to automatically be switched to the screens of controllers. Even if the information had been seen by controllers, officials doubt there would have been enough time to act on the information and to provide a means for the astronauts to escape the fiery explosion. Bruce Hall, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Israeli Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. And recovery crews trying to raise from the Atlantic floor what could be the key to the Space Shuttle Challenger catastrophe. Bruce Hall reports another piece of evidence turned up today, a new photo giving a new angle on the disaster in progress. An amateur photographer has provided the most dramatic evidence yet of trouble with the right solid rocket booster. Two distinct plumes of flame are clearly visible, one from the nozzle, another from an apparent leak. The same picture also appears to show a large section of Challenger emerging from the explosion in flames. In the search area, poor weather prevented more underwater exploration, where CBS News learned a piece of the crew compartment was located yesterday. NASA has neither confirmed or denied the report. Today, NASA redirected its search efforts to what it called its number one priority, the recovery of the right solid rocket booster, which many experts believe may have caused the accident. One of the boosters may be here, 40 miles off Cape Canaveral. The area that uh, we found it in, if uh, anybody's interested, is back off our starboard quarter of it. This afternoon, sensing devices were prepared to be lowered more than 1,000 feet, where the object lies on the ocean floor. Uh, we're going to be dangling this uh, bird right at the very end of the hook, so... Uh... NASA officials caution it may take several days to lift it from the bottom. There has to be a, uh, a very careful study done uh, of the... Uh, the SRBs uh, before they're brought up. For the first two minutes of the flight, the shuttle is propelled by two reusable solid rocket boosters. NASA earlier announced they were destroyed when one headed toward a populated area. However, officials now say only the top and bottom sections were blown away, and the important middle section fell to the ocean, apparently intact. Late today, NASA released photographs and videotapes of the debris that has been recovered so far. Despite an eight-day search, only a small portion of the shuttle has been found. Meanwhile, NASA investigators are prepared to outline all they have discovered to the first formal meeting of the Presidential Commission tomorrow in Washington. Bruce Hall, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. News, Dan Rather reporting.
word tonight that both of the space shuttle challenger solid rocket boosters